Make sure that input's inputting. Looks like it is. We good. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Carter Banks Hour. Um, let's start that intro over. This is looking a little nipply. Too many nipples in there. Still working on... Well, ever since the haircut, I don't really know what to do with myself. I guess we'll do that. We'll do this. I think they call this the... I don't know what they call this. It's called a haircut. But, um, yeah. Bombshell. Last time we, uh, some, some serious Castoglatavian stuff happened. We're not going to talk about it, per se, but we will read about it. God, why is this so bright? All right, anyway, here we go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Carter Banks Hour. Welcome. Today we're going to be reading chapter 25 of Cancer Ward, and it's called Vega. Crazy shit happened last time, I gotta tell you. But, uh, yeah, Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Chapter 25, Vega. She was in a festive mood as she left the clinic, humming quietly to herself. Her mouth closed so that only she could hear. She was wearing a light gray spring coat, but no rubbers because the streets were quite dry. She felt light and springy. Everything was light, especially her legs. Walking was so easy. A girl could cross the whole town when she felt like this. The evening was just as sunny as the day had been. One could feel it was spring even though it was getting cooler. It would be silly to climb onto a crowded bus. She felt much more like walking. So she walked. There was no time more beautiful than when the apricot trees were in bloom in town. All of a sudden she felt she had to see one. Now, before spring came, just one apricot tree in bloom. For luck. Even if from a distance. Or perhaps sheltered behind a fence or a clay wall. You could always tell them by their airy pinkness, but it was too early. The trees were only just beginning to change from gray to green. The moment had come when the trees already had some green on them, but gray was still predominated. Behind the clay walls, the few patches of garden that had managed to assert their rights against the stones of the city showed their dried reddish earth, but nothing more. It was early. Vera always seemed to be in a hurry, but when she got into a bus, she would sit herself down as comfortably as possible on the broken springs of the seat, or else reach out for a strap, hang on to it, and think to herself, I don't want to do anything. In spite of common sense, she knew that she merely had to kill the hours of the evening, then hurry back to work the next morning in an identical bus, but today she walked unhurriedly, and she wanted to do everything, everything there was to do. A lot of things had suddenly appeared that needed doing, at home, in the shops, or the library, or perhaps sewing, or some other pleasant task. There was nothing forbidden or banned about them. They were just things she had, for some reason, avoided doing. She felt like doing them all now, immediately. On the other hand, she didn't feel like rushing to get home, or doing any single one of them straight away. Instead, she walked slowly along, delighted in every step her little shoes took along the dry pavement. She walked past shops that were not yet locked up, but she didn't go into any of them to buy the food or the things she needed. She walked past some theater, placards, but didn't read a single one, even though in her present mood she wanted to read them. And so she just walked, walked on and on. This was her delight. It was all there was to her pleasure. And occasionally she smiled. She'd have liked to have seen an apricot tree in bloom, but there wasn't one. It was too early. Yesterday had been a holiday. 
but she had felt downtrodden and despised. Today was an ordinary working weekday, and she was in such a carefree, happy mood. She had had this holiday feeling because she felt she was in the right. Suddenly your powerful agreements, unspoken because everywhere ridiculed and rejected, which are the little thread by which you hang all alone over a terrible chasm, turn out to be a rope of steel wire. And its reliability is recognized by a wordly wise, suspicious, hard-headed man who is ready to hang by it himself in complete confidence. They were gliding, as in a cable car, over an unimaginable abyss of human incomprehension, and they had trust in each other. This absolutely entranced her. She knew now she was normal and not insane, but knowing this is not enough. She needed to hear she was normal and not insane, which she had now heard. And what a man to hear it from. All she really wanted to do was say thank you to him for saying it, for thinking it, and for having remained himself through all of the setbacks in his life. He deserved to be thanked, but in the meantime it was her duty to make excuses to him. She had to make excuses for the hormone therapy. He rejected Friedland, but he rejected hormone therapy as well. There was a logical contradiction here. Still, one expects logic from a doctor, not from a patient. Whether or not there was a contradiction here, she had to persuade him to submit to this treatment. She couldn't give him up, surrender him to the tumor. She was becoming more and more passionately concerned. This was a patient she had to outdo in persuasiveness and stubbornness until she finally cured him. But to spend hours trying to convince such an unruly, pig-headed man, she would have to have great faith. When he attacked her about the hormone therapy, she had suddenly remembered that it had been introduced into their clinic to conform with a general nationwide instruction which applied to a broad range of tumors. She couldn't for the moment remember the actual scientific paper that described how hormone therapy should be used to combat seminoma. There might be more than one such paper, foreign ones too. To persuade him, she had to read them all. Normally, she didn't have time to read very many, but now she'd have time for everything. She'd certainly read them now. Kostoglatov had once thrown out the agreement that he didn't see why his medicine man with the roots was any less of a doctor than she was. He told her that he hadn't noticed anything very mathematical about medicine. Vera had taken slight offense at the time, but later it occurred to her that she was... I have to readjust this microphone real quick. This is just getting quite annoying. God, it's fucking hot in here, guys. I gotta say, what's up, dude? Thanks for coming, by the way. If you haven't subscribed yet, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Um, the channel's at Carter Banks. Maybe I'll make the Carter Banks hour one day, but for now, it is just the Carter Banks, or just at Carter Banks, and then whatever. Here we go. Kostoglatov had once thrown out the argument that he didn't see why his medicine man with the roots was any less of a doctor than she was. He told her that he hadn't noticed anything very mathematical about medicine. Vera had taken slight offense at the time, but later it occurred to her he was partly right. When they used x-rays to destroy cells, did they know approximately even what percentages of healthy cells as compared to diseased ones would be destroyed? Was this method any more certain than the medicine man's way of scooping up dried root by the handful without using scales? Or, to take another example, Everyone was furiously prescribing penicillin treatment because penicillin produced results. But who in this medical world had actually succeeded in explaining why penicillin acted as it did? 
these were dark waters, weren't they? One had to keep following the medical journals, reading them and pondering them. But she'd have time for all of that now. And now it was... it was amazing. She just hadn't noticed how quickly she'd walked. Here she was, home in the courtyard outside her apartment block. She walked up the few steps to a spacious communal veranda, with railings thickly hung with rugs and doormats. She walked across the dented cement floor and, not in the least depressed, unlocked the outside door to her communal apartment. The floor covering was torn in places. Then she walked down a corridor. It was rather dark. She couldn't turn on all the lights, because they were on different meters. She used another key to open the door to her room. It didn't depress her in the least, this convent cell. It had bars in the window to protect it from thieves, like all ground floor windows in town. The room was by now almost in twilight. It never had any bright sunlight except briefly in the morning. Vera stopped in the doorway and, without taking off her coat, looked around the room in amazement, as if it were all new to her. In a room like this, life could be fine and enjoyable. All there was to do was to change the tablecloth straight away, flick a dust cloth around, and perhaps rehang the pictures on the wall one of Petropavlovsk fortress during a white night, and one of some black. Crimean cypresses, but first she took off her coat, put on the apron, and went into the kitchen. She vaguely remembered that she had to begin by doing something in the kitchen, but first she took off her coat, put on an apron, and went into the kitchen. She vaguely remembered she had to begin by doing something in the kitchen. Oh, yes. She had to light the oil stove and cook herself something. But her neighbor's son, a big strong lad who had dropped out of school, had installed his motorcycle in the kitchen like a kind of barrier. He was in there, taking it to bits, whistling as he laid the parts all over the floor and oiled them. The room had the benefits of setting sun and was still quite light. There was space to squeeze through and get to her table, but Vera suddenly felt she didn't want to bother about things in the kitchen. She just wanted to be alone, in her room. She wasn't hungry either. She wasn't hungry either, not hungry at all. So she went back to her room and snapped the lock shut with satisfaction. There was no reason for her to leave it again today. There were some chocolates in one of the tins. She could nibble at them. She squatted down in front of the chest, the one she'd got from her mother, and pulled out a heavy drawer that contained her other tablecloth. But no, first of all, the dusting had to be done. And before that, she ought to change into something simpler. Vera took delight in every new movement. It was like changing step during a dance. Each new movement delighted her, because that was what the dance was about. Or perhaps she ought to rehang the fortress and the cypress. No. No, that would mean getting a hammer and some nails. There was nothing more unpleasant than a man's work. Let them hang the way that they were for a while. So she shook the dust cloth and went around the room with it, humming softly to herself. Almost at once, she came upon a colored postcard she had received the day before, propped up against a pot-bellied bottle of scent. It had red roses, green ribbons, and a blue figure eight on the front of it. While on the back, there was a typewritten message of greeting. Her trade union committee were sending her their best wishes on the occasion of International Women's Day. There is an asterisk next to International Women's Day, and that asterisk reads March 8. It's celebrated in the Soviet Union as International Women's Day. Originally, the date was to mark the solidarity of the world's female proletariat, but now... It has become simply an occasion of flower-giving and greetings from men to women. Interesting. National holidays are hard for a lonely person to live through, but a women's holiday for lonely women whose years are slipping away 
is quite unbearable. Widowed or unmarried, they get together to drink a lot of wine, sing songs, and pretend how merry they are. Last night, there had been a crowd of them, celebrating uproariously out in the yard. There was one husband among them, and when they got drunk, they all lined up to kiss him. Her trade union committee, without in the least trying to be amusing, were wishing her success in her work and happiness in her private life. What private life? She tore the postcard in four pieces and threw it into the waste bucket. She went on dusting, first some bottles of scent, then the little glass cabinet with views of the Crimea in it, then the box of records by the radio, then the electric photograph in its angular plastic case. Now she could listen to any of the records she possessed, and they no longer hurt. She could put on that intolerable tune, So now I'm alone, alone as before. But she was looking for another one. She put it on, turned the knob for the phonograph part, withdrew herself into her mother's deep armchair and curled her stockinged legs up underneath her. Her hand was still idly clutching one corner of the dust cloth. It hung down from her hand to the floor. The light in the room was already gray. The radio's greenlit dial stood out clearly. It was a suit from the Sleeping Beauty. First the adagio, then the entry of the fairies. Vera listened to it, but not for herself. She was trying to imagine how that adagio would have struck a doomed man who had never known what human happiness was as he listened from the opera house balcony, soaked with rain and isolated by the pain of his disease. She put it on again, and yet again. She began talking, only not aloud. She was talking to him in her imagination as though he was sitting right there across the round table from her in the room's greenish light. She was saying all she should have said, and she was listening to him. She had an unerring ear for what he might have replied. He was a difficult one to foresee, the way he twisted and turned, but she felt she was getting used to him. She was finishing the conversation they had had today, telling him what couldn't have been said, their relationship being what it was, but it could be said now. She was developing her theory about men and women. Hemingway's supermen were creatures who had not yet raised themselves to human level. Hemingway was a shallow swimmer. Oleg would be bound to bark back at her that he'd never read any Hemingway. He would even make it into a boast. None of that stuff in the army. None of that in the camp. This wasn't at all what a woman needed from a man. She needed attention and tenderness and a sense of security when he was with her, a feeling that he was her shield and her shelter. And it was Oleg, a man without rights, who had been deprived of all significance as a citizen, who for some reason made Vera feel protected. Ideas on what women should be like were even more confused. The most feminine of them all, people thought, was Carmen. They reckoned the most feminine was the one most aggressive in her search for pleasure. But this type is a pseudo-woman, a man in women's clothes. On this point, there was a lot more that needed explaining. It seemed he'd been taken by surprise, he hadn't been ready for the idea, but he was thinking about it now. While she put on the same record yet again, it was quite dark by now, and she had forgotten about her dusting. The green light of the dial was deepening, casting its glow further and further over the whole room. She had no desire to turn the light on, not for anything in the world, but she simply had to have a look. In semi-darkness, her hand reached out confidently for the little framed photograph on the wall. 
she lifted it up with affection and brought it close to the dial. Even without its green starry light, even if it went out now, Vera could still have made out every detail. The neat face of the young boy. Those unclouded, vulnerable, inexperienced eyes. The tie hanging down over the neat, white shirt. The first tie he'd ever worn. It was his first suit, too. Yet, he still hadn't minded spoiling the lapel, for there was a severe-looking little badge screwed into it a small white circle enclosing the black profile of a man. The photo was six by ten centimeters, so the badge was tiny. But in the daytime, one could distinctly see. Her memory was so clear that she could see it even now, that the profile was Lennon's. The boy was smiling. This is the only medal I need, he seemed to be saying. It was this boy who had thought up the name Vega for her. The agave blooms once in its lifetime. Soon afterward, it dies. This was the way Vera Gangart had fallen in love. She had been quite young, just a schoolgirl. But he had been killed in the war. After that, whatever aspect, just, heroic, patriotic, or holy, the war took on for Vera Gangart, it was the last war ever. The war in which she, as well as the man she loved, had been killed. When it happened, how she had longed to be killed as well. She left medical college immediately. She would have liked to go to the front, but they wouldn't take her because she was a German. They had still been together during the first two or three months of the war's first summer. It was obvious that he would go into the army quite soon. Now, a generation later, it would be impossible to explain how it was that they hadn't got married. How could they have wasted those months? Even if they weren't married, the last and only months they were to have. Surely there should have been no barrier at such a time when everything was cracking and falling apart. But there was. It was something she couldn't now justify to anyone, not even to herself. Vega! My Vega! He had cried to her from the front line. I can't die and leave you, not my own. If only I could tear myself away for three days, leave. Or three days in hospital, we could get married, couldn't we? Couldn't we? Don't let such thoughts break your heart. I shall never belong to anyone else. I am yours. This was how she wrote to him, confidently. But he was still alive then. He wasn't wounded. He didn't go into the hospital or on leave. He was simply killed. He was dead. But his star burnt. It kept burning. But its light was wasted. It wasn't the sort of star that still gives light after being extinguished. It was the sort of star that shines, still shines with all of its light, yet no one sees the light or needs it. They wouldn't take her. They wouldn't let her be killed, too. The only thing left was for her to live, to go back to medical college. She even became group monitor there. There's an asterisk next to group monitor. The asterisk says students in Soviet colleges are divided into groups, each of which has its monitor. Part of the monitor's duty is to organize participants in volunteer tasks, such as helping the collective farms with the harvest or construction workers with their extra work on Sundays. She was always first to volunteer for harvesting, for cleaning up, or for Sunday work. What else was there to do? She graduated with a first-class degree. Dr. Oreshenkov, whose practice she had worked in, was very satisfied with her. It was he who had given her a recommendation to Donsova. There was now only one thing that mattered, her patience and their treatment. Here was her salvation. Of course, if one thought on the Friedland level, the whole thing was nonsense. Madness, a complete anomaly. Fancy remembering a dead man instead of looking for someone who was alive. 
It just wasn't possible. After all, the laws of tissues, the laws of hormones, and the laws of growing old were indisputable. Were they? But Vega knew that none of these laws applied to her. They were abolished as far as she was concerned. It was not that she felt eternally bound by her promise. I shall always be yours. It was more that someone you have once been very close to never entirely dies. He is still present, seeing a little, hearing a little. In fact, he exists. Helpless and wordless, he will see you betray him. So what was the significance of the laws of cell group? Reaction or secretion? What relevance did they have if there was no man like him? And there wasn't. So what did cells have to do with it? Or cell reactions? It was simply that we grow dull with the passing years. We grow tired. We lose all the true talent for grief or for faithfulness. We surrender to time. Yet every day we swallow food and lick our fingers. In this respect, we are unyielding. If we're not fed for two days, we go out of our minds. We start climbing up the wall. Fine progress we've made, we human beings. Vega had not changed, but she was crushed. Her mother had died too. She used to live with her mother, just the two of them. Her mother died because she too was crushed. Her son, Vera's elder brother, had been an engineer. In 1940, he'd been arrested. For a few years, he still wrote. For a few years, they sent him parcels somewhere out in Buryat, Mongolia. Then one day they received a strange notification from the post office, and they gave Mother her parcel back. It was ink stamped all over, and the writing was crossed out. She carried the parcel home like a coffin. When he was born, he would just have fitted that little box. It crushed Vera's mother. Then to cap it all, shortly afterwards her daughter-in-law remarried. Mother could not understand it all. She understood Vera, so Vera stayed on, all alone. Not exactly all alone, of course. She wasn't the only one. She was alone among millions. There were so many lonely women in the country, it made one want to count up who were there more of, those on their own or those who were married. These lonely women were all about her age. All born in the same decade, the same age as the men who were killed in the war. The war was merciful to the men. It took them away. The women it left to suffer to the end of their days. The bachelors who managed to drag themselves back from the ruins of the war did not choose wives of their own age, but younger girls. As for those who were a few years younger still, they were a whole generation younger, like children. War hadn't crawled over them like a tank. So there they were, those millions of women. No one ever formed them into an army. They had come into the world to accomplish nothing. They were a fallow patch left behind by history. Those among them who could take life as it came were not the doomed ones. Long years of ordinary, peaceful life went by. Vera lived and went about like someone in a permanent gas mask. It was as if her head was enclosed by a skin of tight, hostile rubber. The gas mask drove her mad. It made her weak, so she tore it off. It looked then as though her life had become more human. She allowed herself to be agreeable. She dressed carefully and did not avoid meeting people. There is a great satisfaction in remaining faithful. Perhaps it is the greatest satisfaction of all. Even if no one knows about your faithfulness, even if no one values it. If only it made some impression. But what if it made no impression? If no one needed it? However large the round goggles of a gas mask are, you see very little through them, and what you see, you see badly. Now without the goggles in front of her eyes, she might be able to see more clearly. 
but she didn't. She was inexperienced, and she hurt herself badly. She was incautious and made false steps. Short, unworthy intimacy brought no light or relief into her life. It soiled and humiliated her. It smashed her wholeness and destroyed her harmony. To forget was by now impossible. To obliterate was out of the question. No, taking life as it comes was not her forte. The more fragile a person was, the more dozens and hundreds of coincidences were needed to bring him closer to another. Each new coincidence can only fractionally increase this closeness, whereas a single discrepancy can destroy everything in a flash. With her, this discrepancy always managed to appear early and to stand out clearly. There was no one at all to advise her what to do or how to live. Each man has his own path in life. She was strongly urged to adopt a child. She talked about this at length and in detail with a number of women. They persuaded her. She warmed to the idea and was already going round visiting children's homes. But in the end, she gave it up. She couldn't start loving a child just like that, out of despair or because she had decided to. There was a great danger. She might stop loving it later. And a greater danger still, it might grow up a stranger to her. If only she had a daughter, a real daughter of her own. A daughter, because then she could bring her up in her own image. She wouldn't be able to do that with a little boy. She couldn't bring herself to walk along that long, miry road again and with a complete stranger. She sat in the armchair until midnight. She hadn't done any of the things crying to be done since early evening. She didn't even turn on the light. She had had enough light from the dial on the radio. Her thoughts flowed freely as she watched the green of its light and the black markings of the dial. She listened to a great many records and was not upset even by the most melancholy. She listened to marches, too. Marches were like a triumph unfolding before her in the dark, while she sat like a victor in her old armchair, with its high, throne-like back. Her delicate legs curled underneath her. She had crossed fourteen deserts, and now she had come home. She had crossed fourteen years of insanity, and she had been right all along. It was on this day that her years of faithfulness had acquired a new, final meaning. Near faithfulness. One could regard it as faithfulness. Faithfulness in what counted. Today, too, she became aware that the one who had died was a boy. That he wasn't her age now. Not a man. He hadn't had that unwieldy, heaviness men have, which is a women's only refuge. He hadn't seen either the war as a whole, or its end, or the many difficult years that followed. He had remained a young boy with unclouded vulnerable eyes. She went to bed, but although she didn't fall asleep straight away, she wasn't worried that she wouldn't get enough sleep that night. After she fell asleep, however, she woke up several times and had a great many dreams. Too many, perhaps, for a single night. Some of them were merely disturbing, but others she tried to keep in her mind for the next morning. She woke up in the morning and she smiled. She was squeezed, jostled, and pushed all over the bus. People stepped on her feet but she put up with it all without taking offense. She put on her white coat on her way to the daily five-minute conference. She was pleased to see a powerful, amiable, awkward, gorilla-like figure in the distance coming toward her along the lower corridor. It was Lev Leonidovich. She hadn't seen him since his return from Moscow. His large arms seemed too heavy for him. They hung down, almost dragging his shoulders 
down with them. It looked as if there was something wrong with them, but in fact they were the most handsome thing about him. His head was modeled with bold strokes on many different levels, its crown set well back and topped by a funny white cap like the ones pilots wear. As always, it had been slapped on carelessly. It looked rather useless with its two pig ears sticking up at the back and its hollow crumpled top. His chest under the tight white coat with no opening at the front was like the front of a tank camouflaged for snow conditions. His eyes were narrowed as usual, and he walked along looking stern and threatening. But Vera knew he only had to shift his features slightly, and they would turn into a grin. This is exactly what he did when he and Vera emerged simultaneously from the corridor in different directions and met at the foot of the staircase. I'm so glad you're back, she said. We really missed you. His smile widened, his dangling hand caught her by the elbow and turned her toward the staircase. Why are you so happy? he asked her. Make me happy too. Oh no, it's nothing really. Well, how was your trip? Lava Leonovich sighed. It was all right, but a bit upsetting. Moscow's a disturbing place. You can tell me more about it later. I brought you some records. Three. Did you? Which ones? Well, you know, I... I'm never too sure about... Saint Sainz and those people. They've got a new LP record department in... G-U-M now. Asterisk next to G-U-M. The biggest department store in Moscow. I gave them your list and they wrapped three of them up for me. I'll bring them... In tomorrow. Verusia, let's go to the trial today. What trial? Didn't you know about it? They're putting one of those surgeons on trial. He's from number three hospital. A real court? No, it's comradely court so far, but the investigation took eight months. Comradely court, according to this asterisk, is a group of colleagues who try a man for social misdemeanors. Its decision has no legal power, but it can refer a case to a regular court. Interesting. What's he charged with? Nurse Zoya was coming down the stairs, having just finished her night duty. She said good morning to them both. Her golden eyelashes flashed in the light. A child died after an operation. I'd better go while I've got a bit of Moscow energy in me. I want to make a hell of a fuss. A week in this place and you're back with your tail between your legs. Shall we go? But Vera didn't have time to reply or to make up her mind. It was time to go into the conference room. There was the same bright blue cloth on the table and round it some little armchairs covered with sheets. Vera put a high value on her good relationship with love. He and Ludmila Afonseyevna were closer to her than anyone else in the clinic. The most precious thing about their relationship was that it was one that hardly ever existed between an unmarried man and woman. Lev never gave her that special look men give. He never dropped any hints, never overstepped the mark, never staked out any claims. And of course, neither did she. They had a harmless, tension-free friendship. There was one subject they always avoided, never mentioned and never discussed. Love marriage, and the rest. It was as if these things did not exist. Lev Leonovich presumably guessed this was the type of relationship Vera needed as well. He had married once, stopped being married, then had a friendship, quote, with someone else. The female part of the clinic, which meant the whole place, loved talking about him. At the moment, they suspected he was having an affair with one of the operating theater nurses. One of the young surgeons, Angelica, emphatically declared that this was the case, but some people suspected she was after love herself. Ludmila Afonsievna spent the five-minute conference drawing angular figures on a piece of paper, which she managed to tear with her pen. On the other hand, Vera sat more quietly than ever before. She felt an unfamiliar steadiness in herself. 
the conference ended and Vera began her round in the big women's ward. She had a lot of patients there and always took her time. She would sit down on each bed, examine the patient, and talk softly to her. She did not insist on complete silence in the ward during her rounds because it was impossible to stop the women from talking for so long. One had to be even more tactful and circumspect in the women's ward than in the men's. Her status and distinction as a doctor were not accepted so unconditionally there. She only had to turn up in a slightly better mood than usual, or be a bit too cheerful about promising them that everything was going to be all right, trying to apply the principles of psychotherapy, and she could feel the women's staring at her blatantly or enviously looking sideways at her. What do you care? The glances seemed to say, You aren't ill. How can you understand? The same principles that made her advise these diseased women, frightened out of their wits, not to let their appearance go to pot, she made them do their hair and put on makeup. But if she spent too much time on her own makeup, the women would not have given her a particularly warm welcome. Today was the same as ever. She moved from bed to bed looking as modest and collected as she could, ignoring the general noise in the ward and attending to the patient she was examining. Suddenly, a particularly coarse and unrestrained voice reached her ears from over by the opposite wall. Don't talk to me about patients. Some of the patients here are on the job morning, noon, and night. You take that scruffy one, the one with the belt round his middle every night duty he gives that nurse, Zoya, a bit of a cuddle. What's that? What did you say? Gangart asked the woman she was examining. Will you say that again, please? The patient started to repeat it. Zoya had been on duty last night. So last night while the green dial was burning. Excuse me, would you mind repeating that, please? Right from the beginning and in detail. Uh, yeah. So it looks like... I'm getting these characters a little confused. I'm going to have to, like, think about that. Because Vera Gangart and Zoya... Oh, she's jealous of Zoya. I get it. Whatever. All right. Uh, yeah, 26. Chapter 26 is called Superb In Initiative. Maybe I'll do, like, one episode breaking this all down. But for the time being, I must go. Thanks for tuning in to the Carter Banks Hour. Hope you all enjoyed this chapter. If you want to hear previous chapters, there's a playlist that I've got them all. One through 20... Five at this point, Cancer Ward, Chapter 26, I'll read on Sunday. And uh, yeah, we're like way past the halfway point here. So appreciate y'all tuning in and um, have a great rest of your night.